I'm sorry, man. Dr. Beck, a lot of respect. He's been saying what we're talking about, we're going to talk about for years. For years he's been saying, no team will not work without diversity. He's a, here's a new fellow into our team, part of our team, Dr. Rick Haney. He's same age, 52 years old. Can you believe him? That's his daughter. Married a 35-year-old woman. He's got a baby. I said, Rick, how'd you do it? Cover crops, baby. Cover crops. <laughs> I said, I had farmers coming to sign up. I signed me up. I'll do cover crops too. Dr. Joe Clapton, how about Adamir? When I met him, I gave him a big hug. I said, thank you, Adamir, for teaching us about the multi-species cover crop. See, Gabe learned how to do the mixes from him. The mixes, you eat cocktail mixes, <coughs> is spreading all over the country because of the no-till in the plains. Because of no-till in the plain. Chris Nichol and our beloved Ray Ward. You know what I say about you, Ray, when I'm up there? I said, here's a man of humility who has a lot of education that's willing to learn, to continue to learn. And by the way, his employees love him. They treat him like, like he's a dad. So if Ray Ward can learn at any, we can learn at any age, any age, willing to change our paradigms, aren't we, Ray? Huh? Okay, and we also gotta put up an engineer. We gotta put up an engineer. I love putting engineers up there because you know what? They're easier to teach than agronomists. <laughs> Why? Because they're not, they weren't trained in agronomy. They don't have the paradigms. Now, again, I always start off with these basic three principles that I always go with. Context, context, context. We need to understand your social context, ecological context. That farm is still part of the ecosystem. Never stop being part of the prairie or never stop being part of the woods. Sorry. Or the desert. It is still ecologically connected, and it wants to be treated that way. We need to understand people's social context, the economic context, and more importantly, global context. Global context. Number, this one's really important, the soil's a habitat. If you don't understand these three principles, I can't help you. I tell my landowners, I can't help you when you offer your, your inputs. Number two, is protect the soil as a habitat. The soil is a living ecosystem. And if you don't understand that, can't help you. I have farmers, you do not go, I have some farmers that are growing 200 bushel corn on gumbo clay soil, no-till in Indiana. You know, that's not supposed to work. You're not supposed to grow. No-till doesn't work on heavy clay soils. Yes, if you don't look at the soil as a habitat, that farmer won't even let Tractor, uh, he will not even let his uh, employees carry a lunchbox on the tractor. Too much weight. See, if you don't look at soil that way, you don't understand it. And let me kill another one. Um, our beloved uh, Dwayne Beck, you do not dig in the soil without permission. Only Ray Ward has permission. <laughs> not really. I do it anyway. He does it anyway. I wouldn't do it. Because he looks at that soil as a habitat. It is that critical. And this is the other one. Here's where no-till failed. Here is where no-till failed, ladies and gentlemen. All we did when we did no-till is stop the decomposition process. But we didn't feed it. We did not feed it. See, it won't work without diversity. It's those fantastic plants that convert chemical energy into biological energy and give potential energy to the soil and feeds the microbes. Okay, global context. This is very critical. You need to understand, I think that 20, farming for the 21st century is going to get tougher. What did the price of corn go to recently? Yes, last year it was $7, wasn't it? What is it today, Ray? Four dollars. Four dollars went up. Four four dollars and ten cents. Yesterday, well, a couple days ago, it was three eighty in Ohio. You know what the break-even point in Iowa for corn is? Four fifty. Mmm. So here's what I tell my landowners. Here's your choice. If you focus on yield, you will be a slave to yield, and you will never be free. If you focus on inputs. Inputs will make you free. If I help you reduce your inputs and make your soul so healthy, 
You're dependent on no one. On no one. That's what this is about freedom. So here's what I love to start off with. This is going to be our challenge in the future. It's going to be energy and water. How many of you, please raise your hand, think that fuel is going to go down? It's not. <laughs> because you know what? I got 2.3 billion reasons. It's called China and India. Three, four years ago, they had a 60-mile pileup, and they were stuck in the car for 11 days. In 10 more years, they will supersede the United States in buying cars. Where's the energy going to come from? Oh, by the way, we found more energy, and we're more conservative with it. So why are we still paying 320 and 340? Connectness. We need to understand our global context. So when I walk on a farm and ranch, I'm looking from a social, ecological, global, national context. Because it's driven. Everything we do is driven by that, folks. This is modern agriculture. This is this emblem for modern agriculture. Because we're blowing it on the other end. Okay, so what do farmers care about? Nutrient cycling and water holding capacity, right? Especially here. That's what you want. Okay, but here's the problem right off the top of the bat. It's the way you look at things. It's the way we look at things. First, let me give an example. How many of you, now watch this while I was telling you, Joel. Please raise your hand and tell me, how many of you farmers and ranchers, how many farmers and ranchers do we have in here? Raise your hand. Okay. Did your mom and dad tell you when you start farming, or you inherit the farm, your goal is to farm in nature's image, to collaborate with it, to synergize, that's the template. Don't watch the neighbors, you'll go broke. Raise your hand. I did that in front of hundreds and thousands of people. Do you know how many people raise their hand? They don't raise their hand. College graduates, myself in ag school. <clears throat> you know what I learned in, in ag school? I've learned reductionist science. What is that? You study the little pieces and you forget that the little pieces are attached to the whole. We are now promoting holistic science called ecology. The whole. You need to understand the holes and the pieces. Let me give an example. You're so enamored with the, for the tree, you forget you're in the forest. When farmers make decisions, you have to make it from holistic science. The pieces are too intricate. <coughs> They're moving. It's too complex. So you have to do it in holes. You have to see it that way. Because if you don't understand this, how are you going to be able to save water and build organic matter in your soil? Because this is what this is talking about, water management. Unless you understand and have the right concept about this, you're going to miss the mark. So, I am a product of reduction of science, and when I go all over the country, guess what? A major and I was, not one of my professors, Ray, not one of my professors told me, your goal is to emulate nature. Collaborate, synergize with it, understand it. You know what I was taught in college? Control and command. Force, manipulate, spray to death, kill to death, fumigate to death. That's what I was taught. That's the majority. Of, and guess what? I just got that from California, and you know how many of the students rose there, raised their hand? None of them. They were taught the same way. But this is what we see. This is why they say, well, cover crops won't work. Well, what do you expect when you're dealing with a degraded system? The context. Majority of our soils are carbon depleted, ladies and gentlemen. Our soils are naked, cut, hungry, thirsty, and running a fever. Temperatures get to 150 degrees in that kind of situation. I love doing this one. I know some of you have seen this slides, some of them, but I'm giving you some new slides here, folks. But I gotta bring everybody in here. I told the EPA, EPA, we don't have a runoff problem. We have an infiltration problem. Runoff is reactive. When you say infiltration, <coughs> it is proactive. We deal with the raindrop the moment it lands. And if you went at the buffer, game's over. I went to Scott's place, and, and I was told some of the researchers told me around that area, we don't get runoff. Is that true, Scott? <laughs> no. We get runoff, even in the desert. Because if it does land so. and get intercepted there, it's going to move. Do you see this 
This is taken off my iPhone. I told people, I said, yeah, can you imagine me saying this in headquarters? I tell them, our lakes and rivers are filled with conservation plans and nutrient management plans. <laughs> Not crystal clear with understanding. You probably wonder why I still have a job. <laughs> me too. <laughs> Look at this. This is what we saw. This was tweeted in Texas. This is our beloved Colorado. Scott and I there, and I was at Becky. This is what we saw, didn't we, guys? Oh, yeah, look at our beauty. Oh, and this, we're paying for this. This is CRP. Conservation Reserve Program. After 75 years of conservation, I am 52 years old. I thought I would never see the Dust Bowl in my life. A lot of plants. We've been giving billions. Why does it still look like this? Because we're out of context. Because we're not teaching holism. We're teaching a little fragmented pieces. No more. We are going to bring healing to the land. We need to see holes. We forgot something very powerful, and I'll show you in a little while. We need to manage. You can't manage the land, folks. You don't manage land. You don't make the nutrient cycle run. We, hold, we do nothing. What we are supposed to do is real simple. It's to have the humility to learn and mimic the template. It's too complex. It's too beautiful. We need to manage holes. This is the first thing we need to understand. Everything is connected. Everything is one. Quantum physics, theology, ecology, everything is one. The microbes, everything is connected. You impact one thing, you impact everything. Let me show you. This is our situation. This is the rest, most of the planet. We have a dysfunctional water cycle. We screwed up the carbon cycle, the water cycle. You gotta remember, the water cycle is not complete until the water goes into the soil. A giant buffer. The most giant, largest carbon sink in the planet. The second one is the soil. The first is the ocean. Carbon, carbon, carbon. We'll talk about that in a little while. But it happens right here. Okay, here's where it's interesting. Why we missed it? Why did we miss the biology? Why did we miss it? Because, you know why? Because it's difficult to teach adults about ecology. It's easier to teach children. I'll tell you why. Children do this. When they see an elephant, they go, whoa, it's beautiful. When they see a little bug, they go, whoa, it's beautiful. So here's what adults do. They see the elephant and go, whoa, that is so cool. But when they see the little insects, the microbes, the insignificant, they go, hmm. They put distinction. All of it is good. All of it serves function. Everything counts. So here's why we missed it, because we couldn't see it. It's right here. This is an aggregate. We need to go all the way down to the soil. And guess what? You know what we left out of the, the movie? Here. It's these organisms. They drive the nutrient cycle. They help complete the water cycle. You missed this part. You missed most of it. Let me show you here a very cool little video. Joel, go ahead and... Uh, oh, I'll do it right here. Yeah. Let me show you real quick. I'll just do this one. But you know what? I fully appreciate. Let me show you this is an agronomist an from conventional Virginia, field like this. this. You really she need to be out here during the it. most intense thunderstorm of the year. Since most people aren't willing to do that, here in Virginia, we use a rainfall simulator to help our farmers tell the story of what happens when it rains really See, hard. See, water's an issue over there too, folks. Do we have one on the left? We start with a tray of dry, loose soil taken from a clean till field. On the right, we start with a slice of intact surface soil from a long term no till field. This soil is not only protected with a mulch of cover crop residue, it also has a stable porous sponge structure. You know, years ago as a kid, I remember, you know, you'd get these, these big, heavy thunderstorms in the summer and it would just it would just wash the field and you'd end up with, with mud down the road. And I'm talking about mud that you'd go over there with a the skid loader and scoop out of the way so the cars could go down the road. What I'm seeing now is I'm seeing these heavy rainfalls and I'm barely seeing a trickle coming out of the field. 
This is an error that gets 35. After we simulate an extremely intense thunderstorm for five minutes, the differences are obvious. Most of the water we apply to this soil has run off into this jar, carrying away with it a thin but very significant layer of topsoil. How many times go off right there, John? What do you think? A lot. It's by a ten times. We just applied an inch and a half of very intense rainfall to this bare till soil. Now watch this. Obviously, we harvested very little for future plant use. How much rain did we harvest there? We saw that at Scott's place. Meanwhile, this no-till soil has absorbed virtually every drop of water we applied. What little ran off is clear. The bottom line is pretty simple. If you want to harvest more rain like these no-till farmers are doing, keep your soil covered on top and make it a sponge underneath. Look at that. All of it got wet to the bottom. Now, let's go to the next one. The reason I'm showing you this, I want you to see what happens in our pastures in our rangeland. So if we're going to be able to save water, the difference in we have to be able to capture it. Between a continuously grazed pasture versus a rotationally grazed pasture. This is to really see the difference, you actually have to be out there during the heaviest thunderstorm of the year. It's really good videos, by the way. But I, I have a program in that I'm Cut. Uses a rainfall simulator to demonstrate the effects of infiltration of the glass on pasture surfaces. Look how much is running off. These pasture the, samples were collected from pasture. actual pastures just down the road from each other. One represents continuous overstock and overgrazed pasture. The and other represents a rotational grazed and rested right. pasture. All rainfall runoff is funneled into a collection jug on the front of the demonstration table. This allows us to visually compare both the volume and clarity of the runoff. The most important nutrient we have to manage is water. Uh, with oh, why would he say that in an area of 44-inch precept, guys? It's amazing to see how much more Only here. Oh, it's only here in Colorado. Colorado there's, a, there's an issue, right? Versus the well-rested, rotationally grazed pasture. Now, I want you to, I'm going to stop here. I want you to see, see, Joel, can you get over here? Just click on that for me, would you? Yep. I want you to... Now look how much Here you can see how much more how much actually soaks in and absorbed under the rotational grazed, well-rested pasture, and how much more water actually runs off okay, the stop. continuous grazed pasture. Would you stop there. I'm going to go around. You're supposed to have name tags. This is not a good. Really this is not dry, a good venue. A Everybody's supposed event. to be called on. How do you want your pastures to perform Sorry. when your forage is Okay, stop right there. Okay, why? When I, what's the difference between those two canopies? Click it. Let's go back here. I'm really, Back. I'm really techie. Yeah, this is a this is a Mac. Okay, let's go back a little bit more, because here's the class. I'm going to ask the class. This is really important here. It's an important point. I'm willing to take some of my precious time. Oops, I went too far, didn't I? Can you go a little bit more? By the end of the demonstration. Okay. Now I just ah, oh, it's okay. <laughs> okay now. Why was there more runoff on the overgrazed? Okay. <laughs> it's like I'm almost in your grill, right? There's more I'm going to be in your grill. There's more soil exposed. More soil exposed? Is that? Is that? PLO. What do you guys think? Come on, Less uh, porosity. Less porosity? I'm not going to argue those. Less carbon. Less carbon, I'm not going to let me tell you. If I drop that, if I drop both those soils into the slate test, is the overgrace going to fall apart? How many think it's going to fall apart? You don't think it's going to fall apart? Why? If I grab the overgrazed, get a clod, and get the properly grazed, get a clod, and drop it in and run the slate test, will it fall apart? Will it begin to slake? They should hold together. They should. They'll hold together. You didn't till it. Right. Are you, yes, ma'am. It's kind of like my sister went to one of our farms in Nebraska. She got this big, huge bucket filled full of really deep black dirt, and she was so excited she brought it home. She's going, I'm going to plant all my flowers on this, and they're going to be so beautiful. And I said, it's going to be no different. She goes, what do you mean? They said, we're in Colorado. 
It's going to suck all the moisture out of that soil, and you're going to have nothing different than you have. She goes, it's black. Look at it. I mean, literally, it looked like this. And about a week later, she came home. She goes, my tools are all I said, oh, really? <laughs> Why's that? She goes, look at it. It's like clay. I said, uh-huh. <laughs> because it's for the same reason. The humidity is less. Well, inside. here's the thing that I think we can, I think we need to realize. Did you see the height of the grass? We need to understand we graze too much. We overgraze that canopy height. Remember, that raindrop is coming at 15, 20 miles an hour. When it rained at Scott's, did it come down gentle, Scott? No. It was coming down like this. How are you going to intercept and slow the raindrop down? We overgraze. So here's what happens. When you overgraze, now guess what you did? All in one event. You screwed up, you screwed up the water cycle, the nutrient cycle, and the soil food web, which is the bio community cycle. All these ecosystem processes were screwed up because you had the cow out there too long. If you mow your lawn too short, you hurt the soil ecosystem. You mess up all those ecosystem processes, and we interface where? At the soil level. At the soil level. So where's the, where's the drinking trough here? Look at the drinking trough here. That's why I mow my grass here in North Carolina like that. So what did we do for the whole West? We overgrazed it, and we continued to overgraze it, and we overgrazed it until it did an ecological shift, and I'm gonna show you that in a little while. We need to understand these processes. How can we talk about water conservation if you don't understand these ecosystem processes? You deal with them every day. Scott deals with them every day. You need to understand whether it's forest or a prairie. These ecosystem processes are intact. The farm and ranches are not. They're diminished. We tilled it. We screwed it up. We overgrazed it. So they're not working. You need to understand nature's telling us something. Our farms are low, high disturbance, low diversity, high human input. They're disrupted. We need to be more like nature. She's low disturbance. She doesn't till. She doesn't invert herself. High diversity, low human inputs. She's given us the template. This is not a correct statement. Steady state. Nature's never in a steady state. She's in dynamic equilibrium. Here's the important thing. How many of us take into consideration when you're talking about prairie, forest, soils, this is the bacteria dominant, this is a fungal dominant. Look how important the soils, how important soils are. And look at the ratios of bacteria to fungus. Very critical. When I go do a soil sample on a very heavy till soil, you're gonna have fungal bacteria ratio of zero to one, high nitrates, locks of and lack oxygen. When you start going into prairies and shrubs, you start having more fungus, less bacteria. Look at the deciduous tea, trees. Look at parent material. We need to understand that because it's the biology and the plants are connected. They're one. Talk about it in a little while. Okay, now riddleness scale or the fragile scale. From a one to 10, North Carolina is a level two brittle scale. That means it's not very brittle. The brittleness here is what, Joel? Eight. Eight. It is very brittle. What does that mean? Explain why you need to, know, you need to understand this about brittleness. Extreme rainforest. North Carolina is about an eight. Colorado is an eight. Why should I care? What is that saying to us? What is that? What is this? So why do I care if one's more brittle or not? What do I mean by that? Kyra? Huh? You need moisture recovery. You don't have recovery. Why? Humidity. Why? That's what it functions on. All of the bugs, all oh, the animals under Bless under your heart, Joe. Yes. It's the bugs. The ability for the soils to cycle quickly. It's aquatic. Soils are aquatic, even in eastern Colorado. Let's go here. Now here's the, now you're getting some new slides, boys and girls. <laughs> That's where I, right next to in Hornada in Las Cruces, where I went to college. That's 1961. That's the research station. Do you know what that is? Short steep prairies? 
you probably took that picture, didn't you? Yeah, it was zero. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh really? <laughs> this? Ooh. I'll get him later. Look at this. This is Ray. This is Mike. Very disturbed system. No, but here, and honestly, look at this. It went from here to here. So when I went to college in 95, this is what I saw. But that, was under, that was under a, uh, an exclosure too, right? This was, yeah, this was isolated, no animals. Now here's the thing. How did it go from a bacteria energy pathway to a fungal dominant energy pathway? You guys know what I mean? What do I mean? It shifted. It went from a lower, from a higher energy level to a lower energy level. Why do I call a fungal dominant energy pathway a lower level of energy? Less carbon. Less carbon. What else, Joe? Come on, Storm. What else is going on, Scott? What else is going on? Why is it lower, a lower energy level? What do I mean? It's not clean. Not enough nutrient cycling? Good. What else? Why do I say fungal dominant now? What do I mean by it's fungal dominant? Woody. Wood is a shrub or fungal dominant. So that means they can sequester nutrients under severe conditions. In fact, do you know what? When a soil is completely dead, let me give you an example in North Carolina. We had a farm that was so dead, not even the scabs would grow. I call weeds the scabs, the healers. When weeds don't grow, it's bad. Do you know the only thing, they, how they brought that soil back? They planted conifers. Why would conifers survive where weeds would not survive? Spruce trees, conifers. Because they're incredibly fungal dominant. They were able to extract the remaining nutrients <coughs> in the soil and give it a head start and kick again. When you have a system like that, now, how do we fix this? I'll show you. Oh, by the way, yes, I'll, I'll get there later. You know what this is? This is managed by the BLM. We took cows out. The answer, the blaming the cows. That wasn't the problem. It's the person running the cows. It was all of us, the lack of understanding. This is by the National Park Service. Cows excluded. This is what scientists, <coughs> this was the answer. It was the cow's fault. It wasn't the cow's fault. It was this, ladies and gentlemen. Because we overgrazed, we, we took away the carbon of the soil, the organic matter was not there anymore, we had no covers, we shifted biologically, that water evaporated. It can't hold, there's nothing to hold. So it's functioning. If you look at most rangeland, you have big, giant bare spots like that. Soil temperatures are about 130, 140, 50 degrees right between them. Now, if you look at the grass from a distance, you go, oh, it doesn't look too bad. But when you look right on top of it, it looks just like that. Then it starts to oxidize. Too much rest. This is why our CRP land is failing. You need to graze them. These grass systems are designed to cycle nutrients quickly. That's why it's called a bacteria energy pathway. They have to cycle quickly. They need cows. They need manure, urine, fecal matter, saliva, hair. They need it all. So how are we gonna fix our rangeland? You know what the term is called? Do a mobile link. You bring the cow to the point and distribute manure and urine. That is the typical way a grassland would look. So how do you do it? Herd impact. We mimic the buffalo. And how do you, how, so, how, so how are we going to do it? Let me tell you how it works. See, we need, see, in the grass, how are we going to push that carbon into the soil? Do microbes have legs? They don't. You have to bring them that tight, 100 to 200,000 pounds to the acre. And you've got to move them quickly. See, it won't work if it doesn't look like that. Do you see any bare ground? No. Now look at here, the space of the cow pie. 
It's got to be a foot and heart. It won't work if I got a cow pie right at the side, uh, by the, the door or here. You're not framing the microbes. That's where we failed. And then you have to give these brittle environments incredible recovery time. You might graze it one time. And you're only going to take half of that. And you're going to push most of it in. Now, what are ranchers going to say to that one? They're going to freak, aren't they? Lack of understanding about soil ecology and soil biology. Now, it's the bugs. What do we need? The reason I want those cow pies is because of this, folks. This is the reason we want those cow pies tight. Right there. You see those protozoa? You know what they do? They're predators. They're like hyenas, coyotes, the mountain lions of the soil. They eat the bacteria. They're called, I call them the bacteria, the gazelles. Everybody wants to eat them, the deer, the mule deer. They come and graze. Here come the predators. Nutrient cycling starts happening. But it only starts happening when the plants start sending messengers on being grazed. I'm going to send more exudates. And guess how much nitrogen you get out of predation? When the protozoa and the nematode eat bacteria, you get anywhere from 16 to 116 pounds of N in a year. Did we ever account for that? No. We said nitrogen comes from ammonium and nitrate, didn't we? This is the micro herd. This is the herd we didn't take care of. See, if we can't take care of that herd, how do you expect to fix the water cycle? Because they're the ones that repair the water cycle. They're the ones that make organic matter. For every 1% of organic matter, I now hold 18,000 to 25,000 more gallons per acre. Organic matter is 58% carbon, ladies and gentlemen. 58% carbon. I can hold that much more water per acre. But I cannot do without them. These are the builders. See, I even got special music, romantic music for you guys. <laughs> emotional. I get emotional when I see this. You know how many earthworms? This is taken with a special camera at night. If I have a good, healthy, functioning soil, I, need, I want to see anywhere from 10 to 20 earthworms per cubic foot. That's 850 to a million earthworms per acre. They will, they will turn the soil over in two years by themselves. They'll take that six inch profile and completely till it under. And that's the right way of tilling, not the way of the disc. This is the reason why I don't even go in my my yard anymore, my no-till garden. They may not find me. Of course, right, the shoes are gone. They drug me down. <laughs> <laughs> what, a way to go. what a way to go, Ray Guy. Went with the earthworms. <laughs> Folks, when you have that kind of earthworms, you know what that is? That is a special model where they pour these plastics into these earthworm holes. So when it rains, when we got that rain scott at your place, if you have infiltration like that, that is awesome. And you know what else I love about those holes? Earthworm poop. It's got 9 to 11 times more phosphorus and nitrogen. And the roots go down there and they catch it and they go bonanza. So let's go on here. I want this right here, folks. It's right here. This is water conservation. Unless that whole soil food web's intact, it's not going to work. My job is to capture water. Let's see what we have here. I forgot what I put here. This is what we have. Dysfunctional soils. Look what happens. This is what most till soils look like. This is the glomalian, the glues, the organic matter, the biotic glues, the cementing agents that earthworms, fungus create. Glomalian, glomalin is created by fungus. When you take the glomalin out, look what happens. Doesn't that look familiar like most of our soils? This is our problem. Until we make our soils go like this, how are you going to do water conservation? You can't. Now, here's a misnomer. What is wrong with this picture? Biology, physical, chemical. It's a trick question, boys and girls. 
What is wrong with that question? When you see all the literature, <laughs> they give equal footing. What's wrong, Joe, with it? Go back. Go back. What is wrong? Oh, what's wrong with that one? What's wrong with that slide? I disagree with that slide. Anybody? If you look in the literature, that's what it looks like. The biological should have more of an effect. Thank you, Joe. It should be bigger. Do you know what that new science is called? Niche construction. Earthworms change the pH in the soil. Earthworms change the pH in the soil. Guess what else? The bacteria, the organism. That's called niche construction. You might want to type that and go into that website. Darwin had it wrong. He used to think that they, if you put all the critters and animals, they were going to adapt to the environment. It's not true. It's a two-way arrow. Organisms modify the environment. Beavers modify the environment. What happened there? They modify the environment. You modify the environment. Don't you? It's biology. Biology makes the physical. They make the house. And when they make the house, then the chemical's possible. Do you see where that goes? We used to say they were all equal. They're not all equal. Only life can beget life. Chemistry ions are not flowing by themselves. But here's the key. I used to think three years ago, four years ago, and it's interesting, some of the top soil health guys all came to this conclusion on our own way. Three, four years ago, you would ask me what are the limiting nutrients, I would say nitrogen and phosphorus. I say it's carbon. See, because if I get carbon right in the soil, nitrogen will come with it. The phosphorus, <coughs> who makes phosphorus available? It's the organisms, guys, it's the organisms. They release phosphatase. They release this powerful enzyme. I don't know why this is doing that, but earthworm, I mean not earthworms, root, uh, mycorrhizae excrete phosphatase. And guess how else? The leaking of root exudates, citric acids, they become so make phosphorus available. Dr. Christine Jones. Soil carbon is the key driver for the nutritional status of plants and therefore the mineral density of animals and people. It is carbon. Ah, does that look familiar? Scott, remember that day we were out there? Yeah. Would you tell them what we saw right there between where your son Brandon is there? What did we see there? Seeing a uh, difference in the amount of residue underneath that crop that he's standing in. Do you know the difference between that right here and here? the carbon on the surface of the soil. It made that much difference. Look at the distinction. If we bring the carbon cycle back to our place, can you imagine what we could do? They need to look in the background of them pictures too. Look at the it. one on the left. Look at this. That's the day. That's not fog. That is not fog. That is the neighbors blowing over to Scott's. That's how you get topsoil. <laughs> you know where you know where my epiphany changed and I started questioning everything? It's when the North Dakota boys did this test plot. There it is again. <coughs> what happened it was very interesting. I wonder what's going on. I don't know. Couldn't that it's, it's, it's right on your computer. It's my computer? It's, no, the, oh. there's it's the slides are on the computer. It's search. Yeah, it does its search and pulls it up. But yeah, and it's kind of like there we go. I can move the slides quickly. It's time to show up or you get off the get off the stage. <laughs> One okay, here's what I, here's my quick point. Here's where I learned to start questioning. In North Dakota, they did a test plot. This word this test plot, by the way, was no till <clears throat> and five years CRP. So you know what they did is they did this test plot and they grew all these monocultures. And then they stick all these mixes together. Why am I showing you this? Because I say nature is more collaborative than she is competitive. Let me show you. Look what happens when you grow a monoculture under 1.8 inches. That looks pretty bad, right? How about the oil sea radish? Now, this is what causes great consternation among the researchers when I show them this slide. Look at the test plots here where it's brown. Why, if I mix the seed together under 1.8 inches, does it look like this? But if I grow it as a monoculture, it looks like that. See, because when I went, I went to graduate school for weeds, they say, 
do not have plants growing too close together because they're going to store water and nutrients. Weren't they all taught like that? Well, what, what's going on with that? They all got 1.8 inches, guys. What, what the heck happened there? Whoa. This keeps coming up. Ray, I was there and saw that. And, and, oh, and you know what, Ray? I wish we could clone you and take you with me everywhere because they think we're liars. <laughs> it's just... It's just it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. But guess what? The research came out. You guys want to read this cool paper? Those who are unbelievers that might be in the back? Called the Stress Gradient Hypothesis. Google that paper. Dr. Mark Barton is professor of biology in Brown. And he says, you know what? They did research all over the world with communities. Communities under stress do not compete for water. They facilitate that means they help each other out. Now here's where I got my epiphany. I don't know if you ever had these, Scott, in the bedroom when I go in the, I was reading my books in the bedroom. Well, that didn't come out right, did it? <laughs> I, do, I do get those epiphanies in the bedroom, and I'm reading, that's why I read. And go back to that so I can pull up. Yeah, it's called The Stress Gradient Hypothesis Ecology Letters by Mark Burtness. Burtness, Biology of Brown University. Read the paper. Don't believe me. I hate this thing. No, you're not, hitting, the, you're not hitting the button. No, I'm not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, because that's, okay. that's a little. And so, what the thing is. The little Chinese thing down there in the corner is what's starting to bother me. Oh, that's Chinese. good. Yeah, there we go. It is. Yeah. I just got to keep moving along here. But uh, here's. <coughs> what's going on? What's you, got a, you got a music? My background? Mac is driving me crazy. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> I got voodoo going on here. Okay, I'm going to see if I can. Do you want me to run it by manual? Yeah, why don't you run it by manual? Okay. We'll do it one more time. And then I'm going to just shut up and go, to, go away. Okay. Okay. Well, Apple stock's down right now. Man, my, my, their stock's down. Okay, here's an epiphany. Here's my epiphany I was trying to tell you guys. The plant and soil are one. They are not different units. The plant and soil are one. You probably think, well, big deal. It is a big deal. You need to understand that. No plant, no soil function. That's the conduit of energy. That's the protection. That's the biological primer. Let's go, let's pass this one. Now, let's get into a case study. This is New Mexico under irrigated pecans, sandy, sandy soils. How do we convert that sandy soil and start bringing the soil alive? So what we did is compost. See, you've got to remember at New Mexico State, they told us you never grow vegetation between the trees. Okay, I'll, run, I'll run it from here. Okay, go ahead. You never put vegetation between the trees. Why not, sir? Why do you not put vegetation in between the trees? It steals water. It steals water. And what else? And nutrients. I, they, they, they put that in our head. Boy, they told us over and over. But stay tuned. Well, guess what did? We, we generated that sandy soil, put manure, and we planted... Um, Looks like Bermuda. Bermuda, thank you very okay. much. And I'm Bermuda. Used to oh, used to rain on top. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's brilliant. Here's the compost. We put four, and then we added another four or five tons. And guess what started happening in this very sandy soil? It started to turn dark. We started getting a dark agratosphere and detritosphere. And then guess what we saw? An earthworm in sandy soil. The literature says you can't see earthworms in sandy soil. That's what the literature says. That's not true. You can see it right there. Then look at the trees with the micro sprinklers. These are, plant, these are actually done with micro sprinklers. This farm, this whole farm, Mr. Diaz is probably the first one. His average yield for pecans is 3,000 pounds. Do you remember Mr. Diaz? That's the new field. Now, guess what? You know what the common thing we were taught in Mexico State? Disc the snot in between here, make it bare, spend all the diesel, then buy all kinds of fungicides and, 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 and insecticides to control the aphids and the issues. Now that we're growing covers, the crop yield has, a, has been stabilized now. We hold more water. We use less pick water. 
We use less water. Frustrating, isn't it? I, I don't know what to do. I don't either. <laughs> I'm not now, involved. here's the pecans now, folks. Look how they look. They're not supposed to look that way. Now, here's the trick question. If I did an organic matter sample right here and right here, do you think there would be a difference? Storm, come on, you, you, yeah. you're thinking something. I gotta move the slide back and forth, hold on. <laughs> come on, tell me, what do you think? Do you think you'll see an organic matter difference, audience? In a I'd couple, three, four, five years? Yes. No. No, no he did. We saw an active carbon difference. We saw a labile carbon difference. Total organic matter is the house, the construct. Labile carbon is the food. You can live in a, I've seen soils with 12% organic matter, big house, but it was starving to death because there was very little labile carbon in the system. Microbes were starving. It's like living in a mansion, but you spend all your money on the house, you only can afford hot dogs. Do you know what that is right here? That is an aggregate. That is grain cells, grain sands fused together with these organomineral complexes. Once you get the house, this is the house, ladies and gentlemen. Unless that house, we cannot hold water. You cannot regulate temperature. You cannot regulate pH. You cannot regulate metric potential. You can't deal with electric conductivity. You can't deal with salinity issues. It's that house. You know what that is right here? That is a sand particle ray coated with these organomineral complexes. Now they can hold on to cations. See the difference? Now I can hold on to water. <laughs> now I, the soil will hold. How much time do I have? I'm already over, right? Right? An hour over? Look at that. That's what I want, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, here's a real cool thing. This is Rudy's backyard. We are now doing errant farming. This is really cool, Ray. Guess what we're doing now? You see this? It's all sandy, sugar sand. Rudy's wife looked on the internet and she came up with us. She heard a guy talk about using wood chips and put them in the soils. So they went and put about an inch of wood chips and guess what happened? There was watermelon seeds that grew out of that, those chips and produced five big watermelons with no phosphorus and no nitrogen at all. The salt brush started blooming. All these things started blooming and all we did is put the wood chips. Why? Not only all the moisture, what else? Covered. What? Covered soil. The covering, the regulated temperature, what else? Carbon. Carbon, what else? Increased biology. Oh, thank you. All those. Guess what? We're thinking there's mycorrhizal relationships going on with the, per the perennials communing with that watermelon. Why did we get five watermelons, big watermelons out of that with no fertilizer? This is sugar sand, right? This is sugar sand. We're going to do this again. That first inch is so critical. Look at the, look at the vegetation. All we did is throw carbon. I had an idea. What if we got this big machine, grinded all the mesquite on the country, and bring cows back in, maybe we can heal our rangeland, maybe? Carbon. We took carbon away from the system, we're gonna to have to bring carbon back. So here's my point. How are we gonna heal the land here? How are we gonna bring the healing back? Carbon. You gonna change my laptop? I'm almost done. Nope. Let me wrap it up. And carbon you're saying from a burn, correct? Huh? Carbon from a burn? No. From, from wood chips. From wood chips. From manure. Okay. From residue. Burning is a, you have to be very cautious with burning. There's the watermelons. They don't kill stuff here in Colorado. Yeah, burning is the exception, not the rule, for, especially for soil biology. Look at this. Look at the watermelon. You see chlorotic ray? <laughs> no fertilizer. Boy, that's a really good Were you underwater there? <laughs> huh? Did you take that underwater? <laughs> What's going on? Are you, are you out of power? Or? I don't know. <laughs> my, my, um, I think, you know, this is the first time I had my laptop has ever had problems with that. Uh, I'm going to show a couple more slides. We'll wrap it up, guys. Maybe I should just go right here.
Okay, now I'm going to go through 30 slides in five seconds. Ready? Okay, ready, go. I just want to show you a couple more slides and then we'll, I'll wrap it up. The computer's giving me so much a hassle. It's too bad because there's some really cool stuff. Come on. It's disgusting. Okay, let's just pass that. Let me go right here. Let's get, let me get to the point. We're going to wrap it up. Wow, this computer is a doozy. You know, I never had problems with this thing here until I came to Colorado. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Okay, here we go. I'll wrap it up here. Let's just go here and then we'll wrap it up. I'm going to zoom through this last couple of slides and then we'll just kind of wrap it up. But here's the thing, folks. We're starting... It'll come up. Folks, we're going to have to change the way we think about the ecosystem. Totally change everything. What we're saying is we need to follow the template and we've got to have the humility to follow the template. I want to see cows run like that. We're going to integrate it with our cropping system. We're going to graze multi-species cover crops. Scott's working that way. Oh, by the way, some people say, well, we don't have all these kind of cows. That's mob grazing five acres with two cows. Don't tell me it can't be done. It's not number, it's density. And we're gonna follow chickens, that's Gabe's. We're gonna have chickens following the herd, just like the Serengeti. Nice thing about this, these are five to seven dollars a pound and three dollars a dozen. And the Midwest, guess what that is? What is that back there in the red? It is a cover crop seeder and sprayer for standing corn. Look at that. Why would farmers do that? Because they came to our soil health workshops and we told them covers are the most important thing you can do on the land. Look at that. Why do I want that? Because when I have a cover that big, when I get harvest my corn, guess what? I sequester nutrients, I feed my microbe, and store the nitrogen and save it. Look at this, when my farmer went to North Dakota, that's a gandy box for a cedar. As you're harvesting corn, it's throwing cover crop seed. See, without the plant, I can farm without fertilizer. I can farm without a herbicide. I cannot farm without a plant. Look what we're doing in, in, in North Carolina. North Carolina, we get 55 inches of, of uh, 44 inches of rain. Do you know what the most limiting factor is over there? Moisture during the summer. We grow corn with less than 11 inches. So I told my farmers, let's build carbon. Let's roll that cover crop down. Look at that no-till planter going right into that. Isn't that beautiful? Give you give you How about how about uh, Idaho? That is furrow irrigated. It won't work on furrow irrigated. That's cover crop on furrow irrigation. For every time I hear it won't work, I hear that all the time. Here's my buddy. You know what he's doing? He put a seeder, inner seeder on his potato seeder. He planted winter pea, intercrop winter pea into his potatoes. Multi-species mix. Ah, last couple of slides. What's my vision for soil health, folks? When they asked me a couple of years ago, my, my counterpart said, Ray, what is your vision for soil health? I said, my vision for soil health is that I hope that we'll start having commercials of earthworms. We'll have Tom Cruise showing earthworms and we'll have NRCS and we'll have people like Scott on a commercial. I am sick and tired of car commercials and Viagra commercials. <laughs> sick of it. Why can't we have soil food web commercials and have people like Scott and his son coming out there and healing the land? And here's my other vision. You know my coworkers laughed at me. They laughed at me. I said, why are you laughing? Do you know what the problem is? We're so eager for the crumbs at the, on the bottom of the table. No more crumbs. Let's have a vision. We're going to teach everybody. I told the chief, we're going to train everybody in this country so they know some of the things that you guys are doing in healing the land. And here's another thing I like. My vision for farming is, is that when you can buy a press, Scott, you buy one of these seat presses and you can run your truck and you can run your tractor. Did you know when you go to Europe, you can buy a truck, a tractor that runs on vegetable oil? The diesel engine was discovered by, I mean, invented for Dr. Diesel to run on peanut oil. Why are you paying for fuel? 
Why can't you not run your pivot off vegetable? Run it off your soil. Tie all the carbon, all the nutrient cycles together. Then you have freedom. And you're not dependent on no one. Not on crop insurance. I have farmers who do not use crop insurance, ladies and gentlemen. They farm with no crop insurance. They are reducing their water uses by Brandon Hockey has dropped his usage five inches per acre by farming this way. Do not be dependent on the government and anybody else. This is how we're going to change this country. That is my buddy there, our hero, Jay Fuhr, and all of North Dakota. We've been part of it. How are we going to do it? We're going to farm in nature's way. That's what it is. Soil health is farming nature's way. It's biomimicry. My last slide. I love this slide because you know why? The French philosopher says men argue, nature acts. This is what I saw around Scott's place. Not Scott himself, but that's what we saw, didn't we, Scott? You know what? We're so in love with our toys, our technology, but we're destroying our planet and using up the last limited resources at a very high speed. This is how we're going to fix it. Humility. Understanding. If we're humble to say, you know what? We're not that smart. And we decide to have understanding to follow the template and then understand it and use the wisdom about it to emulate it they will stop the desert. That's how we're going to save water, ladies and gentlemen. That's how we're going to save water, heal our planet. I'm excited about it. Because you remember this? Remember this? You know what that is? Biosphere 2. Was that a success? Not. So, I tell my farmers, mimic nature, start building community, farmers work together, and you know what Kansas is doing after we start doing the soil health talks? They are doing mentorship programs where farmers get together and they visit each other and the district conservationists and they have mentorship programs and they'll have breakfast. You know what they talk about? Soil health. See, you've got to remember, Scott, how old are you right now, Scott? 38. 38. You're going to farm 40 more years, right? Maybe even longer, right? <laughs> Maybe. So we got 50 years of farming, right? Yep. You make one mistake in an environment like Scott's, that can cost you 10% of your whole farming career. Why are we not helping each other? We used to think it's about competition. No, your competition is global. We need to build mentorship programs, and we're starting to do that. I'm finished, ladies and gentlemen. I am telling you I'm glad to be here. I'm glad Mike got me here.